Hello everyone. My name is Priyakshi and I am from EV Reporter. Today we are glad to welcome you all to India Lithium Ion Battery Recycling Conclave 2023 organized in association with Lico Materials. So today India's lithium ion battery recycling sector stands at a critical juncture that presents its challenges and many untapped opportunities. To help us all get a clear view of the current landscape, players' initiatives, and the future outlook for the sector, we have invited a stellar set of industry leaders who are joining us today. So let me quickly run you through the event schedule and speaker introductions. So we will start with a session on the importance of circularity by Mr. Gaurav Dolwani, who is the CEO of Lico Materials. This will be followed by a presentation by Mr. Pritesh Singh, specialist case and alternate power trains at Nomura Research Institute. And he will be talking about the current uh, LIB recycling landscape in India and who are the leading players and what kind of commitments they have made in this space. This will be followed by uh, a presentation on reverse logistics, repurposing and recycling of lithium ion batteries by Mr. Rohan Singh, founder of Zetrax. After that, we will talk about the economics of lithium ion battery mm -hmm. recycling. Mm -hmm. To guide us through that, mm -hmm. we have Mr. Devaraj, mm -hmm. director of Sangeel India. Mm -hmm. And after the uh, after Mr. Devaraj Mishra's presentation on economics of lithium ion battery recycling, we have a stakeholder roundtable, which will be moderated by Mr. Randhir Singh, who is the CEO at 4C Advisors. And the panelists would be Mr. ALN Rao, CEO at Exigo Recycling, Mr. Gaurav Dolwani and Mr. Venkat Rajaraman, CEO at Signi Energy. This will, will be followed by another short presentation on the evolving input trends for end of life lithium ion batteries, how we are moving from LCO and the other chemistries to an LFP heavy waste battery uh, mix. And it will be taken by Mr. Rahul Bolini, founder of Bolini Energy. Once we are done with the presentations and the stakeholder conference, we will have a short Q&A session. So I would like to uh, remind all the audience members to only use the Q&A box for submitting their questions. The panelists can see your questions at all times and some of them may choose to answer these questions by typing in the answers within the Q&A box itself. And some of the questions we will take for uh, verbal answers towards the end of the event. So I would again like to thank all of the speakers and panel members for making time to be here today and to all of the audience members for joining today. So without any ado, let me quickly welcome Mr. Gaurav Dolwani, CEO of Lico Materials, to start by discussing the importance of circularity for India. Over to you, Mr. Dolwani. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the India Lithium-Ion Battery Recycling Conclave 2023. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Priyakshi, and your team for including us in this wonderful discussion. Sure. Today, I'm going to talk about the importance of battery circularity for India. My name is Gaurav Dolwani, and I'm the CEO at Lyco Materials, which is a company based on the lithium ion recycling and refurbishing sector. We are based in Mumbai and operate a plant in Nabi, Mumbai and we're looking to set up our second plant in Bengaluru next year. So this is my agenda for today. I'll move towards the first point, battery demand and the electric vehicle market. The expected growth in the Indian battery demand is, is expected to rise to 260 gigawatt hours by 2030, where 40% of the share would be dominated by electric vehicles, such as passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles, two-wheeler, three-wheelers, and buses. This would require nearly 26 gigafactories with an average battery production capacity of 10 gigawatt hours per year. The conservative scenario battery demand would require 10 gigafactories by 2030. Uh, I'm so sorry, Gaurav, uh, do you mean to share your screen or? Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Not yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we see it now? Yes, yes. Sorry about that. 
Yeah, thank you, perfect. So yeah, this is a bit about our agenda for today that I'm going to speak about, starting with battery demand and the electric vehicle market. So the expected growth in the Indian battery demand, we're expecting it to rise to 260 gigawatt hours by 2030 as per Niti This would require nearly 26 gigafactories with an average advanced battery production capacity of 10 gigawatt hours 10 gigawatt hours per year. The conservative scenario battery demand would require 10 gigafactories by 2030. Since India has no manufacturing plants at this scale now, developing and rapidly scaling its advanced battery manufacturing industry is expected to require focused and coordinated public-private actions. With such high growth and requirement of demand across EV, passenger, commercial, two-wheeler, three-wheeler, and buses, Let's see an overview of EVs in the next slide. The Indian electric vehicle market size was valued at $220 million in 2020 and is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 94.4% from 2021 to 2030. The attractive incentives being offered by the Indian government on the production and purchase of electric vehicles to encourage the adoption of electric vehicles are anticipated to drive the growth of the market over the forecast period. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic triggered a significant decline in overall sales of passenger and commercial vehicles in 2020. However, sales of electric vehicles in India remain unaffected. The post-lockdown sale of pure and hybrid electric vehicles is a prominent driving factor for the electric vehicle market in India. The stringent greenhouse gas emission norms drafted by the government, such as Bharat Stage 6 emission standards introduced by Ministry of Road Transport and Highways are also expected to play a decisive role in the growth of the market. I'd like to move towards the need and potential of battery recycling. So the first point is limited resource availability. Recycling of batteries can generate a source for rare metals. Using recycling technologies, 95% of metals can be recycled for reuse in manufacturing new batteries. Environmental hazards, if not handled well, they could reach landfills, thus con contaminating soil and groundwater. The environmental impact of metal recycling from lithium ion battery waste is significantly less than from metal extraction of virgin material from mines. Import dependency, it's a critical factor for India to establish a domestic recycling ecosystem to save foreign exchange. India's major imports are from China, which hold the majority of global cell manufacturing capacity. Supply chain disruption. The pandemic has exposed business risks and as a result of disruptions in the global supply chain, resulting in longer lead times for raw material deliveries. The recent Russia-Ukraine war has also had an effect on supply chain for key battery metals such as nickel and aluminum. Price discovery, creating a well-established recycling ecosystem can help discover the resale value of batteries for reuse and recycle applications. The battery recycle potential it's extremely important for India as it aims to be carbon neutral by 2070. As conventional energy use transitions to renewable energy, batteries at the end of the EV application can be used in a second life for stationary energy storage. According to Niti Aayog's estimates, new batteries would create a recycle volume of 128 gigawatt hours by 2030, of which around 46% will come from electric vehicles. This does not include production waste generated by cell manufacturers. To treat this volume, India's lithium ion battery recycling capacity would have to increase about 60 times over the next eight years from the current levels of two gigawatt hours. Reuse will extend the usage of retired EV batteries in other applications and recycling will ensure the local availability of the battery critical materials and reduce the pressure on raw material mining. This will also help the environmental and carbon footprint, as well as greenhouse gas emissions. 
I'd like to talk about the circular economy, challenges, and gap analysis next. The battery industry must transition from a linear to a circular value chain, where used materials are repaired, reused, or recycled. This transformative approach holds significant economic potential, exemplified by current opportunities like battery recycling. A large cross-industry effort and coordination will be needed for stakeholders to achieve the full potential of a circular value chain. Companies could benefit from investigating sustainable and economically viable applications that would increase circularity or by leveraging technological advances that contribute to this goal. This is a typical image from when we get a scrap battery from electric vehicles. We test it, we determine state of health. If there's an opportunity to reuse it, it goes towards battery repurposing and a second life battery application. And if there is, if we don't see uh, any reason or any potential for it to get refurbished, it goes towards recycling. The challenges in battery waste. Safe transportation, which is probably the most important here. Currently, there's an absence of robust transportation guidelines for safe transportation of cells and batteries, which lead to fires and accidents. I think all of us have read several stories, seen many videos where we have seen where in the absence of safe handling um, or a safe movement, uh, there have there are about to be accidents. I think the onus on this does not only lie with the recycler, but also with the OEM. Design constraints, there's an absence of eco-design during assembly for recycling to employ corrective methods. Battery packs that we receive, some of them are conducive for recycling and refurbishment. And some packs are designed in a way that it's almost impossible to reuse them. We see battery manufacturers in China and Korea now speaking with recyclers and taking their input on designing new packs so that they're easier to dismantle. A lack of traceability, existing policies do not provide tracking of material used in batteries, which is critical to reduce the carbon and environmental footprint of the batteries. So <clears throat> in Europe, they recently introduced a battery passport, which means that the OEM for the battery pack would provide all information in the passport. And as it moves down the supply chain, each party has access to that. Today, a lot of OEMs do not are not able to give us the information that we need in order to determine second life for refurbishment. Absence of harmonization. Existing policies do not establish regulatory standards for testing and classifying used batteries that have a second life. We believe that Ministry of Environment and the Central Pollution Control Board are working on the refurbishing guidelines, and we welcome uh, for them to release them soon. Counterfeit documents, unscrupulous recyclers or dismantlers are falsifying documents and reusing the same shipments repeatedly to make their EPR targets. We would request state and central pollution control boards to have stricter audits so that they can weed out such players. Investment recycling plants are capital intensive and will be operating at low capacity as the volume of end-of-life batteries are still very low. Existing policies do not provide any lucrative incentives for recycling capacity and facilities. In the rest of the world, uh, in Europe, in the US, we see particularly a lot of aid by the government centers and states towards recycling. Recently, Niti Aayog uh, had released a statement saying that they will just, they will look at an opportunity for PLI for recycling, and we would be very grateful for that. The challenge and gap mapping. So reuse and recycling are critical aspects of the creation of a circular economy. However, there are challenges to achieving full-scale reuse and recycling in the ecosystem. The gaps and challenges identified in India are as follows. The organized sector in India, the unorganized sector, apologies. In India, the electric two-wheeler and electric three-wheeler segments are shifting from lead-acid batteries 
to lithium ion batteries. The recycling of lead acid batteries was dominated by the unorganized sector, where the tracking of batteries and safety concerns for workers and environment are huge challenges. To ensure safety and address other challenges, the battery reuse and recycling industry requires a robust formal sector. Gaps in data assess asset management and tracking. To achieve a circular economy, end-of-life batteries need to be tracked and the tracking data needs to be managed securely. In the case of lithium-ion batteries, technical data, battery health, and performance needs to be tracked as well. Creating a robust data management tool to trace the entire life cycle of batteries of varying size and chemistry is a big challenge. Safety challenges as well. Lithium-ion batteries are high-power batteries with high residual power, necessitating careful handling throughout their life, from transportation and storage to dismantling and disposal. The batteries need to be carefully monitored and safety precautions should be taken. Transportation and storage. We have observed cases of EV battery fires during transportation. Due to the high residual power, they undergo thermal runaway in some extreme conditions. Serious attention needs to be paid for the safety aspects of transportation. Worker and environmental safety. The working conditions for the lead acid battery and lithium ion battery recycling industries are different. As new players enter the system and technology transitions from LAB to LIB accelerates, the industry needs to ensure worker safety in the recycling process and post-recycling handling of recycled waste material. RUL determination. This is a very important criterion for deciding whether to recycle or reuse. Currently, there, as I said, there's no clarity about determination yet, but it is necessary to rationalize the decision-making process governing reuse or recycling. Segregation, LIVs come in varying sizes and chemistries. The segregation of batteries based on the size, chemistry, state of health is important for making a decision on whether they would be going towards reuse or recycling. Case study, we talk about Lyco Materials in particular. So Lyco Materials is a recycling company with a focus to create a sustainable circular economy solution in the lithium ion battery supply chain for recovery of critical minerals such as lithium, cobalt, manganese, and nickel so that we can give it back to battery manufacturers to give the materials a second life. India does not have any of the critical minerals used to make a lithium ion battery and needs to import them. Lyco aids in diminishing reliance on China and other nations, contributing to an increased decrease in import dependency. Strengthening the local battery supply chain will result in making us truly Atmanilva. Lyco is a smoke and dust free facility and adheres to the highest safety and hygiene parameters. Lyco's process is cell chemistry agnostic and recovers up to 92% of all critical metals found in lithium ion cells. This is an overview of what our process looks like in a very simplified version. So from the time we get batteries, they're shredded, screened, and separated using air density gravity. And the three major products that we derive from our, from our process is copper, aluminum, and black mass. Black mass being a combination of anode and cathode. Refiners downstream would, would be able to recover cobalt, nickel, manganese, and lithium from black mass, as well as graphite. Circularity with sustainability. In order to be a recycler, it's extremely critical to contribute towards sustainability. And LICO adheres to the highest safety and environmental sustainability standards, offering a cleaner and more ethical approach to producing essential finite battery materials compared, compared to the mining industry. Business policy that encompasses all environmental health and safety and quality best practices. Non-chemical process adopted during shredding, this is zero wastage and zero discharge process. There's no sewage treatment and no harmful gas emissions. So the circularity goals ahead for LICO. LICO has recovered battery grade metal salts from black mass at a laboratory level and is testing the output salts with 
cathode active materials manufacturers to validate the same. We are also in advanced discussions with recyclers globally for proven technology at commercial scale using hydrometallurgy for recovering metal salts at battery grade purities. Once recovered, LICO will be pivotal in contributing towards a circular economy solution, which is the ultimate objective. I'd like to thank you for your time and I'll move on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you for that comprehensive overview and also telling us about the importance of circularity for India. Good to know about LICO's current uh, cap capacity capabilities and your future plans as well. So with that, let me welcome uh, Mr. Pritesh Singh for his presentation. And he will be giving us an overview of the current landscape of LIB recycling industry within India. And also who are the leading players and what kind of activities and commitments they have done so far. So uh, welcome Pritesh, please uh, share your screen. Is my screen visible, Priyakshi? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So thank you very much, Priyakshi and EV Reporter, for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, our perspective around the current lithium-ion battery recycling landscape, leading players, and some of the other updates. Baro has uh, uh, already talked uh, most of it, but I'll try to to uh, add some value to the to the audience. We have uh, 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 people uh, in large number attending this webinar, and uh, before I begin, you know, few things are very hard to believe. Uh, for example, if I remember uh, when I started working around electrification, that time there was no presence of uh, or even no talks around recycling, and I personally never expected that uh, whatever level we have achieved so far uh, would be achieved within, uh, let's say, uh, five to six years of time. So I think the, the, the progress has been commendable. In today's presentation, let me uh, talk about my perspectives around need for recycling industry, especially in India, overview of current policy landscape, LIB recycling volume, volume potential and capacity, then the key players in the re recycling industry in India and the way forward. Let me briefly talk about the need for recycling in India. You know, there are, there are different risks, for example, geopolitical supply risk, hazard and sustainability, and the price discovery. If I say uh, talk about geopolitical supply risk, then th there is no developed lithium, lithium mining and processing activity in India, it's completely uh, reliance on the imports. China has biggest share in processing of lithium and a strong control over sourcing of critical minerals in LIB. So that becomes a very big geopolitical risk. Hazards and sustainability can be like 55% lower GHG emissions on utilizing recycled lithium compared to, to virgin LIH from mines. And same is the price discovery. So resale risk pertains around EVs, mainly due to the battery. So recycling improves resale value of batteries and reduce the cost of output ma input material. So recycling can help in solving the challenges. Basically, it can be a hedge against geopolitical risks so to supply chain improve sustainability. It also allows reduced pricing for batteries and eventually EVs. Moving on. Overview of lead, overview of current policy landscape. If I remember, you know, the battery management and handling rule 2001 has not even included, which was again, I think, updated in 2010, uh, but it was not uh, including the lithium ion batteries. And there was an amendment of battery management and handling rules in 2022, which was further amended in 2023. And now lithium uh, uh, LIBs are part of these rules and we have comprehensive uh, policy, which uh, further needs uh, some of the improvements, but at least we have now a very good base. In terms of the key points of this policy, transactable extended producer responsibility, the EPR certificates or the EPR responsibilities are one of the very important part of this policy, which will bring uh, a lot of changes 
the, the way recycling is done, or at least it is going to give a lot of responsibility to different stakeholders on uh, in the recycling industry. So I, I think this is uh, uh, known to everyone that there are different stakeholders in the recycling and that the, each stakeholder has different responsibility, starting from waste generation stage, wherein we, you have producers and the consumers. Producers has the, the responsibility to introducing the batteries into the market, collecting, recycling, and refurbishment. And consumers definitely have to be responsible for a dis, uh, responsible disposal of battery waste. Then you have waste collection collection stage in which we have public waste management authority, collection, segregation, and treatment entities. And eventually we have recycling companies, which you can say the re refurbisher and the recyclers. One of the very important part of the, the policy, which is uh, giving further role or further uh, responsibility to the recyclers is that, you know, they have the recovery targets for battery materials together with Obviously, they have to follow CPCB standards. They have to manage hazardous waste, manage others, solid state waste as well. But the recovery targets are very important for electric vehicle related. If you look at in 2024, 2025, 70% 70, 70%, then 80% in 2025 and 6. And after that, 90% recovery, recovery targets has been, uh, has, has been part of the policy. Also, in terms of EPR targets, which has been starting from 26 to 27 until 2032, if you look at every year at the gap of four years, the 70% of the quantity of batteries placed in the market has to be are like mandatory waste uh, and battery collection target 100% of the refurbishment. So, and, and these targets uh, are uh, very well defined for two wheeler as well as the all kind of vehicle segments in India. It is very similar to different uh, vehicle segments other than there are some changes for, for the three-wheeler sector. Moving on to the LIV recycling volume potential and the capacity part, which I would like to talk. In terms of recycling volume potential, if you look at the left-hand side of the chart, which has starting from 2022 to 26 and 2030, talks about the India battery demand. So India, uh, Battery demand is approximately 232 <coughs> gigawatt hour in 2030, which includes stationary as well as the electric mobility. Electric mobility itself goes beyond 100 kilowatt. And uh, Gaurav was talking about the number of gigafactories we require to have such uh, facilities. So the, the demand is very high and it is definitely going to be the mix of import as well as the domestic manufacturing. There are domestic manufacturers uh, as part of the PLI scheme. We have three. There are traditional, non-traditional manufacturers, um, as well as the startup companies who have announced their capacities, including uh, uh, the traditional battery manufacturers like uh, Amara Raja and Excide. So we can see some traction from there also. Even if it becomes all reality, if you calculate the, the announcements, then also 50% at least is going to be imported. That is what we estimate. Now, if you look at the lithium demand in kilotons for LIVs, by 2030, it's going to be a, only lithium I'm talking about is going to be around 16.1 kiloton. So even if India meets half of the demand locally, it leads to demand of around 8,000 ton lithium in 2030. And uh, uh, the if the announcements which we have or the discoveries which we have around uh, lithium extraction becomes the reality, then also it's going to take up almost a decade. And recycling of lithium from imported batteries would be very, very important for meeting the local demand, which means there is a huge opportunity for the recycling. And recycling can add a lot of value as well. So let's take a look. Uh, in the previous presentation, uh, we were talking about who can be the buyers, so the, the buyers of these the the materials, the extracted materials can, can be CAM material, cathode active material, materials can be CAM manufacturers. Then even once you have the cell manufacturing, uh, I, I was talking about 230 plus gigawatt hour of total demand, mostly coming from e-mobility. Then once it is out from the, the electric vehicle, it can be reused. So approximately 30 to 60% can be repurposed for reusing stationary and grid applications. Then you have two options. Some of them are definitely going to go into, into the landfill, 
but mainly they can be collected and uh, dismantled and material extraction can happen and eventually it can be fed into the cell manufacturing process the cam manuf the cam manufacturers can utilize them and you this is how you can close close the loop so let me talk about the lithium uh, LIV recycling and reuse volume potential estimates. And I'll talk only about 2030 numbers. So reuse potential is around 18 gigawatt hour. Recycling potential is around 22 gigawatt hour. There will be batteries coming out of uh, two-wheeler and three-wheeler segment. And they will be mostly directly going for the recycling because of the nature of the, the batteries. But the batteries which are going to come out from the four wheelers as well as the bus applications, buses segment, they can be majority of them, they, they can be reused, uh, reused in the applications like stationary, mainly into the stationary application. So for 2022 to 2030, if we look at the cumulative, uh, cumulative numbers, 49 gigawatt hour can be reused in the, the EV segment. 59 gigawatt hour recycling opportunity is going to be there uh, in the electric vehicle segment. In the, in, in the stationary application, as well as consumer electronics, reused batteries are going to be limited. But the, <clears throat> the recycling opportunity is around 53 gigawatt hour and 15 gigawatt hour respectively from the stationary applications as well as the consumer electronics. Moving on. I'll briefly touch upon the recycling technology and capacity. So uh, globally also in India also, there are different methods, methods of recycling. And these methods are also evolving because uh, of the, the evolution in the battery chemistry side. So we, we have direct recycling, which is happening in India also. And then you have mechanical processing, which is like then pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy. These are the, the kind of uh, recycling methodology method, methods which which globally as well as in, in india are being used many of the methods are also like uh, 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 a kind of mix of or the combination of these methods for example in direct recycling is mostly suitable for LF, lfp chemistries which are available in pouch and prismatics prismatic form factor if i talk about Pyrometallurgy. Pyrometallurgy uh, generally works for majority of chemistries, but but uh, lower applicability for the LFP chemistry. And uh, uh, what I have seen is like the method is also agnostic to type of chemistry, but requires large volume to justify the cost related to smelting. Then for the hydrometallurgy, it works for <clears throat> leaching, you know, followed by selecting uh, uh, precipitation and extraction with solvents. And more, most higher efficiency, efficiency, extraction efficiency would involve a combination of methods, not only one type of method. Moving on, let me briefly talk about the global recycling capacity. Uh, it is well known to all of us that, that China also China again dominates in the recycling capacity as well. So the globally, we have around 400,000 to 450,000 tons per year by end of 2022 based on uh, uh, declared capacities of different recycling companies and china uh, china holds approximately 50 to 60% share of recycling capacity if i talk about india it's re relatively much more small and it goes to be around 5% which has increased in the last few years as i started i as i i was talking uh, in the beginning that now it is picking up earlier it was much lesser let me briefly talk about global recycling players. So here we have listed 15 recycling companies which are present globally. You can see the location here and I'll only talk about the kind of methodology or the kind of technology which they are using. And uh, so one point I want to mention over here is that many of them are like combo, pyro, hydro, pyro and hydro. And some of them are pyro, Purely, but yes, the trend is like the combination uh, of these technologies. Moving on the <clears throat> lithium ion recycling capacity in India market, there are uh, good companies and uh, some, some of them I have seen growing personally also uh, very fast in last few years. I'll talk about few companies. Exigo has recycling capacity of 7,200 ton per annum. Then um, Atero, Atero has 4,000 TPA. Batex is also one of the companies 
which is very aggressive in this uh, around 5000 ton per annum they have the capacity then we have rubamint 10000 tpa then we have uh, companies like lyco materials and then some of some other companies like tata chemicals sungil and and li circle so <clears throat> i'll briefly talk about some of the activities which indian recycling companies are doing uh, so here, uh, let me first talk about the Exigo recycling. So they have a facility, uh, a large plant in Panipat, the, the state of Haryana in India. The capacity is 7,200 dedicated to LIB using the mechanical as well as the hydro metallurgy uh, technology. And they have a dedicated uh, a small R&D center which works on development of the equipment as well as the new methods of recycling. Their preference for NMC chemistry over LFP, they have tie-up wedge log for re uh, reverse logistics. They serve clients like Panasonic, Samsung, as per the, the data available. And they also plan to extend e-waste processing capacity up to 200,000 ton, ton per annum. Then I talk about the Batex, which has uh, 4,000 to 5,000 tons per year capacity for lithium-ion batteries, mainly using the mechanical technology, which means producing the black, black mass and uh, uh, selling it to to the the downstream suppliers who can do the metal extraction. Then we have Rubamin with ten thousand commission in quarter two of twenty twenty four using hydro metallurgy. They have thirty thousand uh, uh, tons per annum capacity, which is again expanding. Uh, expansion is planned in the phase manner with initial operations starting twenty twenty four. Expertise in hydro metallurgy with processing of catalytic content. These are the companies, companies like Exigo, Atero, Batex, Robamin, they have expansion plans, very rapid expansion plans. In the recent past also they have expand, expanded and now in the future also they have a very rapid expansion plan, approximately two to four times increase in capacity. Then we have other set of companies like Lyco Materials, Re Recycle Caro and others who, have, who are producing the black mass processing but they are also expanding into extraction processes. And uh, if industry develops faster, or at least with the, the current pace also, within a few years, some of these companies are also going to, to upgrade and uh, start doing the material ex 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 extraction, uh, not only the black mass processing. So Lyco is a company, which I think Gaurav has already talked in, based out of Mumbai, 3000 tons per year capacity, mechanical, Technology current focus is on separation of current collectors, plastic shredding to to create black mass expansion to mineral extraction by hydro metallurgy with setup of ten thousand tons per annum capacity. There are many more. For example, let me talk about uh, Sangil High Tech India. It's a they are available. They they have they are uh, based out of Anandpur in Andhra Pradesh. They have ten thousand for total capacity of e waste hydro metallurgy processes or the technology they follow. It's a, it's a subsidiary of Korean company, and one of the speakers, I think, will talk about this company in detail going forward. Then we have companies like Mini Mines. They have also capacities 3,000 uh, tons per year, mechanical and hydrometallurgy, and expanding very fast. And they have patented hydro, uh, hybrid hydrometallurgy uh, technology as well. So, this was all about why recycling is needed, what has been the past growth in India, how the future is look like, what is the competitive landscape and how the companies in India uh, for the material extraction as well as the black mass produce, producing are placed and uh, how the future looks like for the lithium recycling in India. The way forward, let me briefly talk that, yes, as I mentioned, uh, that there are so many challenges around recycling. For example, the battery technologies are evolving. There is no fixed technology that this is going to be the future and it's very, very difficult for recycling company to guess and make a strategy that on which technology they are going to tap. So it's going to be a continuous investment and innovation for them as well. Battery material prices are very high. And, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of recycling is, also, is very high. So sometimes it becomes very difficult to, to recycle and even generate profit from the, the recycled material. Then we have the battery pack, as I mentioned that the structure uh, complicates the recycling. Then you have battery collection and transportation. LIVs are highly reactive and safe. Transportation is a very, very big challenge. 
yes there are many challenges but at the same time it's a new industry emerging it's a new field so there is a lot of opportunity also so for example in terms of newer opportunities the indian recyclers on account of expected growth of spent batteries new business models can be explored two three years back i thought that it's going to be a oligopoly market structure but now you see many players uh, operating in different capacity and also planning for upgrading themselves so it's a, coming out to be a fragmented market so in future there is a, a scope for consolidation partnerships in recycling between incumbents and global leaders so if you look at the automotive oems in india i think definitely all of them are going to be with electric vehicles in india they have very very limited recycling capability by themselves so they are going to depend on technology alliances joint ventures etc so the recycling company which evolves and upgrades and becomes a large player definitely going to be finding a way uh, to to be part of a large oem also because all of them are also looking for such partners strategic collaborations as i mentioned with the oems and the trading houses battery manufacturers there is a high possibility of a strategic collaboration so that's all i wanted to talk i hope it was useful over to you priyakshi thank you pratish definitely it was useful and very insightful gave us an overall uh, overview of the industry and especially who the players are so it was very useful to have that list uh, kind of a thing where it sort of summarizes the overall ecosystem for us so thank you for that uh, now let's move on to the specifics of lithium ion battery recycling uh, so we start with the reverse logistics the collection and repurposing and for that let me invite mr rohan singh from ziptrax he is the ceo of ziptrax and he will be talking about reverse logistics of of uh, spent lithium ion batteries repurposing and recycling of the lithium ion batteries good afternoon to everyone and uh, good to be discussing on a very important topic uh, in terms of uh, lithium ion batteries i think there is a huge amount of impetus now being given on technology but i think just getting those batteries safely to the recycling and uh, you know processing them handling them in a safe and efficient manner itself is a uh, very big task so i'll just share my screen with you and uh, we can start with the uh, presentation So I'll give you a uh, small introduction, and uh, then we can you know, delve deeper into how reverse logistics, repurposing, and recycling all come together for a circular economy. So essentially, Ziptrax is a company that uh, started as a company into um, the repurposing, recycling, and recovery for uh, battery materials and uh, uh, enabling the circular economy. We we have uh, our sustainable development goals in mind. uh and uh, while we're targeting that the main problem statement is that you know these batteries themselves are hazardous so handling their waste is is a big concern and uh, this growing concern led to all uh, all of us you know uh, were part of the um, battery waste management rules formation and now they have also come out with a amended 2023 version of the rules which emphasizes uh, uh, on the extended producer responsibility but also brings about uh, certain more categories of uh, battery vehicles and others um, so even today most of the batteries that are coming for recycling are from consumer electronics and legacy batteries because electric vehicles have just started to come into the uh, sector but uh, less than 20% of them are getting recycled in a manner wherein you know we would like them to um, so recycling capacity is not yet 
uh, able to tackle all type of uh, batteries and certain smaller type of batteries are getting hit, uh, out of the system. Uh, we need to look at the battery EPR portal, uh, which is now coming up and uh, we'll try to, uh, you know, envelope all the battery waste types. So the market size in India has been growing and I think um, the previous speakers have spoken about this more uh, uh, more profoundly, so I have not touched much uh, deeper into this sector. But uh, overall, we've been importing a lot of batteries and uh, uh, all of the EVs that, that are selling today. So we just crossed last month in October the 3 million EV mark. And uh, all of this uh, has has mostly been imported in terms of the batteries. So, so uh, last year we've imported about two billion dollar worth of batteries in India, which is one of the largest importers of batteries. So, certainly reusing some materials, handling them in a manner where some battery life extension is possible, would lead to uh, would lead to you know a lot of uh, safety and uh, uh, savings uh, at the same time. Um, in terms of solution for this, so on one side we have a demand of these materials inherently to produce batteries. We need materials. We need a lithium uh, LC equivalent of about forty six thousand tons, graphite of about fifty thousand tons, uh, cobalt and nickel in huge quantities as well to make these batteries. And one of the area is to look at how we can source the waste of these batteries, convert them uh, into the materials and uh, bring those back into the supply chain. So at Ziptrax, we've been developing all of these solutions for some time now. And uh, Ziptrax has uh, developed capabilities right across the supply chain in order to close the loop. So when I say close the loop, it starts right up front. Uh, at the time of sourcing of these batteries, at the time of retirement of uh, uh, battery bags from say vehicles, uh, there's, there's a need to analyze these battery bags, uh, get that data and uh, make that assessment of value as well as the, as the health of the battery. And uh, we, we work through a hub and spoke model where essentially these spokes act as the outreach uh, entities um, and, and undertake the collection and processing of these batteries. Um, thereafter, uh, moving them into second life applications while majority of batteries, as I said, are uh, consumer electronics, so they move into the uh, material extraction, uh, which starts with the mechanical recycling segment, which converts it into black mass. And uh, subsequently, that black mass is then converted into a chemical uh, facility where material recovery, like cobalt, lithium, uh, nickel, etc., can be extracted. This is then further processed. Uh, we started uh, something called a precursor manufacturing, which essentially converts uh, these battery materials back into composite uh, or compounds that can go back into cells. So while these compounds are uh, complex and uh, still very early, I would say, uh, but these are the you know uh, materials that are going to power the next uh, generation giga factories in India. So in terms of sourcing and reverse logistics, largely the uh, waste sourcing channels, uh, some of them have been uh, mandated through the EPR. Um, this includes the uh, EV dealerships, the uh, mobility OEMs themselves have registered as producers, uh, energy storage and solar uh, stationary manufacturers, uh, battery bag assemblers, as well as companies who are importing cells. Uh, so these are some of the EPR mandated. And then there are some non EPR mandated channels, such as uh, channels through e waste recyclers. So, e waste recyclers were previously handling uh, consumer electronics batteries, which were not coming to the um, uh, battery recycling uh, segment directly, but they were part of an electronic uh, previously. So, IT repair centers or collection centers, uh, then producer responsibility organizations, and uh, other lead asset recycling companies who often find themselves in a curious uh, situation because they find uh, lithium ion batteries which they cannot recycle. So, so these are some of the channels that are currently being you know, formalized and uh, under EPR, they are being integrated into the uh, regulation where these companies and uh, both formal and informal entities will need to start uh, you know, creating that value chain uh, to bring about the logistics for these batteries in terms of 
where largely EV sales have been driven. So, um, uh, in terms of state-wise data, largely some of the larger populated states have uh, led the way. Uh, UP, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Rajasthan. Uh, these are some of the larger states where EV adoption has been uh, more widespread. And uh, further, there are states like Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Delhi, and Telangana, which are catching up. So, so there will be an increased adoption. So, this is uh, 2022 numbers, and I'm sure uh, we'll have the 2023 numbers in a month or so from EV reporter. So, so there, there is a, a lot of requirement uh, for setting up these reverse logistic hubs. So, these hubs are not just collection and warehousing; they can also include first stage of dismantling or you know up to the black mass level. So, that's how we are you know positioning. Um, this uh, in a kind of hub and spoke model because um, we need to look at uh, taking battery recycling capabilities closer to where the waste is being generated. Uh, then subsequently, once the batteries do come in, uh, repurposing of these batteries uh, has to be done. Uh, so understanding what happens inside batteries and uh, you know automating that process of uh, creating uh, you know the circular economy as well as data centric uh, you know approach being taken into it so what uh, what has been established from our side has been that you know we we look at this from a uh, perspective that whatever is best usable as an asset should be redeployed and if it is already a liability in terms of you know if it's already converted into a scrap material then it can move on to recycling uh, segment so uh, repurposing essentially um, uh, takes uh, place in, in a few steps where uh, there's automatic assessment of these uh, parameters from these batteries and uh, following which uh, if the battery is reusable, then it's you know, uh, put through the uh, dismantling stage as well as you know then re reconstructed or re-engineered into a, a new battery bank for uh, separate applications. So applications downstream could be uh, into mobility or energy storage or some kind of uh, a smaller power bank, uh, grid connected or off grid. So some of these areas we've, we've been uh, working into for the last uh, two to three years. And uh, there, there is some commercial potential for uh, specific areas here. One of the aspects that need to be you know looked at for repurposed batteries. Um, so one is that obviously new batteries need to be uh, good and they have to have the security and safety but once you repurpose these batteries um there there's, there are no separate regulations as such given for repurposed batteries or second life batteries yet um so what we have done is that you know we've gone with an approach where whatever repurposed batteries that we are uh, working into or uh, retailing need to also comply with the same set of regulations that are coming for new batteries. So if today's regulation is AIS 156 revision 2, then repurposed batteries also need to comply with the same set of uh, you know, standards uh, in order to be known as roadworthy. So some of these product uh, or features or offerings include the likes of you know tracking and tracing these batteries uh, uh, at, at a real time uh, level. So, so there is uh, uh, an increased amount of battery safety. Uh, then thermal management of these batteries to avoid uh, thermal events like thermal runaways or uh, heating up. Since these batteries uh, are all portable, then you know they have to be made compatible with uh, swapping or fast charging uh, protocols. Um, and and since uh, there is the there is the need to look at uh, recycling at the end of life. Uh, so, so this kind of a uh, uh, creates a closed loop and brings it back to the recycler uh, because there's a value associated with that. So, in terms of what happens uh, till repurposing, we've discussed. But what is essentially happening at a larger scale is the recycling. So, recycling um, uh, why there's a need has been discussed, and there's a growing demand for recycled materials, both from the perspective of um, availability of materials domestically, such as you know, part of the PLI scheme where um, incentive is being provided to giga factories uh, because uh, they are using indigenously developed content uh, inside their cells, 
and also from the perspective of you know uh, avoiding imports of uh, or dependence on external countries to, to you know, source these materials so the materials inside the lithium ion batteries are, are plentiful so so you have copper and aluminium that work as current collectors also from the casing perspective your steel or aluminium casing um, the anode can be graphite or it could be silicon and graphite um, active material chemistry defines the name of that battery so lfp nmc various type of batteries um, what what's important is that most of these battery materials are extracted in a manner where they can be put back into some application maybe into uh, manufacturing of batteries itself or into um, uh, uh, some other applications like in the chemical industry or in the stainless steel manufacturing etc um, so so we've uh, had some uh, good amount of work going into the extraction uh, we ourselves uh, have a hybrid uh, uh, methodology for this uh, where we undertake a green direct approach to recycling we we have a uh, chemical uh, stage uh, subsequent to the mechanical uh, process which makes the black mass so spent batteries of any type of chemistry be it uh, lco nmc nc lfp uh, all the battery types can be tackled with the same process and process itself has been uh, very versatile uh, to be able to modularly break into hub and spoke uh, mechanisms uh, while not causing any emissions or pollutions, uh, pollution type like uh, water or uh, solid pollution itself. So, so there is a need to look at uh, these green materials more proactively and bring them back to the cell manufacturing uh, where, where we already started producing the cathode precursor for, for the cell manufacturing. So uh, brief introduction of our team. So I am the founder and look at the technical aspects, also the inventor of the technologies. Uh, my co-founder Sonia, she's uh, in the business operations and we have a good board of directors and advisors has been helping us shape this uh, technology company. Uh, we're expanding our team further now uh, to about 40. And uh, in the past, we've been incubated and supported by Shell as well as Wilco. So that's that's all, all to my side. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank and you. wish you the best for your plans with ZipTrax. So now uh, let me call upon uh, Mr. Debaraj Mishra, Director of Sangil India. And his topic of presentation is very interesting, uh, the economics of lithium ion battery recycling. So as we all know, Sangil is anyways a huge name globally in overall material space and recycling space. And uh, Mr. Debaraj Mishra is heading their operations of the Indian subsidiary. And we look forward to listen to you. Please go ahead, Mr. Mishra. Yeah, hi, Vixi. Hello, Mr. Um, Mishra. Yeah. Nice to meet you all. Thank you, Vixi, to invite Sandeep for this uh, webinar. Um, thanks for your introduction. So, Sangil is uh, just briefly I'll tell about Sangil. Sangil is globally present uh, in different locations across the world. The base is in South Korea. Then we have uh, two plants in China, then Malaysia. And in Europe, we have plants in uh, Hungary and Poland. Uh, coming here, we are planning to have one in Indonesia and uh, another in uh, USA. So right now in India, we are based uh, in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, so the city is located uh, um, 80 kilometers away from Bangor Airport. So this facility is actually only to make block mass. We're exporting the block mass to our parent company for the refinery in uh, Korea to get uh, that rented material supplied the cell management. So the present uh, facility is uh, having 2,000 tons of capacity, but we are uh, expanding it to 5,400 tons uh, next year. I mean, all the expansion is uh, done. Uh, we are in need of uh, license from the culture. 
So today my topic is uh, related to economy of Lithuania and where we study. So I will give you this general overview of uh, uh, costing and uh, what the factors that affect uh, the investment of Lithuania and where we study. Let's start. So when you plan for any lithium better recycling plan, you have to uh, consider several factors like uh, your technology and process. Which process technology you are choosing to start your lithium and battery recycling that is very important. Then the overall uh, investment is also dependent on the procurement of batteries and transportation cost because India is a big uh, geographically area, so obviously there will be huge impact of cost of logistic when you are setting up a plant in south but procuring the material from north. So these things really affect your recycling investment. Then battery chemistry. Uh, so in India we have found so many varieties of batteries starting from LCO, NMC, so many varieties, NCA, LFT, LTO. So whenever you are setting up any plant, you have to see the value of metals in your battery. And you have to evaluate those metal content in the batteries. And that should be focused for your recovery in the final output. Then you input cost in the plant, then output cost of the metal. There should be some balanced or profitability consideration in your recycling facility. Then, of course, uh, the efficiency is also a big matter. If you go for any recycling plant, mechanical or hydro, there should be definitely more than uh, near 95 percent of recovery the all the metals. And those should be. Uh, metal grade and battery grade, which has higher market value and could be give you could give you very good credit. Then while choosing your facility, technology, courses, there will be a lot of impact on environment because you are using uh, different processes where you can see the emission of water, gas, from your uh, process. So those things should be your additional cost to treat environmental friendly and to give very less harm to your ambient area. Now let's uh, see some general uh, view of uh, that care. So left side, Said, uh, part is uh, just direction of total uh, battery bag where you can find the major part is uh, battery periphery outer uh, system so that will be around 30 to 35 percent then your cathode and anode would combine maybe 40 percent then you'll get module and uh, your cell housing and electrolyte uh, inside the battery so just write a table uh, that I have summarized that in one battery pack, which are the possible components we can recover. In this case, uh, cells and casing, do these two, nearly 80 to 85 percent we can recover after disassemble of a battery pack. So, major value will be coming from these two cells and casing. And balance part would be around 10 15 percent, which would be very negligible in your total revenue. And as we are always saying that we don't have the, we don't have any waste when you do the process of lithium battery. But till now there is no such technology where we can have zero waste because the electrolyte contained in the batteries is very hard to recover and uh, separate from the battery. There is no commercial or industrial scale to recover the electrolytes from the battery. Now coming to the <coughs> technologies 
tools we have to adopt for recycling facilities. So the lithium and battery recycling, we usually divide three stages. One is the preparatory stage, where you can prepare, uh, uh, I mean, you have to discharge and dismantle the battery pack. You have to go to main stages, that is pre-treatment and main processing. In the pre-treatment, it is your choice, which one you have to choose as per your investment. Uh, let's say someone can choose pre-treatment of only mechanical process and then go for directly hydro process. Or in some cases, you can also go for uh, thermal heating of pre-treatment, then go for mechanical process and then go for hydro process. So what will happen here? So your cost will go up when you choose uh, pyro process and uh, mechanical process, then you go for hydro or pyro. In the main process, uh, pyro and hydro, your cost will be fixed, but the cost will be varied in your pre-treatment process. So when you go for only mechanical process, there will be very nominal uh, investment. But when you go for pyro process, th that is in energy intensive and your cost will be, I think, uh, double than the mechanical process. So this is the technology what you can choose during your uh, recycling activity. So let's go for the details about the how the cost uh, components of a recycling plan. I've taken this one uh, from WRI resource. So here it, it has shown the hydro process uh, where the direct cost is 58% and the indirect cost is 30, uh, 32%. In the direct uh, cost, uh, it involves uh, the infrastructure and then your process technology and installation. And then in our OPEX, uh, which can be break down as majority will be your reagent chemicals that will be consumed in a hydro process. Then balance uh, major part will be like 40 to 45 percent will be your labor and utilities. Then we have taken uh, some example of uh, uh, the supply technology for uh, generation by revenue for NMC and LFP. You can see that uh, in each process, NMC has upper hand in, in, in terms of revenue generation uh, because NMC always have uh, both nickel, metal, cobalt, uh, sorry, nickel, manganese, and cobalt, which always uh, fetch a good. Uh, value compared to uh, LFP. So in this process, whenever you go the hybrid mode like mechanical process and hydro, there you will get uh, definitely higher revenue compared to other uh, process technology. So in this case, uh, we have found the uh, economic value of uh, each chemistry of each type of battery chemistry, uh, starting from LFP to varieties of NMC and then LCO and LTO. In case of NMC, if you see whenever you go from, from triple one chemistry to 811, then there will be definitely reduction in the you know, revenue and the cost economy will go down because the value, uh, value of cobalt in 111 triple one chemistry and 811 chemistry completely different. But right now in India, majority is uh, this uh, e scooter and all these EVs application are having uh, NMC 811. Then if you see the LFP, which has the lowest among um, the, all the chemistry because it has only lithium, which will give you the money in your process and the highest will be LCO. So current Indian scenario, we are mainly focusing LCO, then uh, NMC, 811, and then LFP. So whenever you are going to set up any kind of recycling facility, you have to choose varieties of chemistry of uh, batteries because only depending on LFP, you will not get uh, your uh, recyclable benefit. So we have to go LFP along with NMC and LCO as well. And this one, I want to show you that 
how the market price, which is uncontrollable for a recycler, and it always affects all the recycler while setting up a recycling plant. So you see uh, the cobalt value, which went up to so high $80 per kg in 22. Later it came down to 30 in $30 per kg in 2023. So whenever you are planning to set up any recycling plant based on this kind of value, definitely you would be in loss. So we have to foresee the market. I mean, we have to see the market, how it is forecasting for all the metals. Similarly, for the nickel and lithium, this market value actually varied only due to the control of only one country, that is China, which has done oversupply. And then slowly the demand came down due to the policy change in China. So it affected the whole world. And then, uh, so obviously also in Indian market, we have seen the scrap fellows, they don't decrease the market price based on this LME price. So obviously it is very big suffering for recyclers. This is a case study of uh, recycling profit, net recycling profit in different region across the globe, considering varieties of battery chemistry. So here uh, you can see that uh, China and Korea, they have major profitability in all type of uh, battery chemistry except LFP and LM. LFP and LM are only showing the positive value while choosing the direct recycling process. But in case of North America or in European Union, you could see uh, except the direct recycling process, all the recycling technology has shown the negative recycling profit. So, in this case, why we are choosing LFP and LMO for direct recycling? Because uh, these two batteries will have always same cost during uh, pre-treatment. But in the post-treatment, when you go for hydro or pyro, it would show definitely negative value. Because the lithium cost is so low at present scenario and your cost of investment will be so high if you go for pyro and hydro it will never give you good value so that is why many people are now selecting for direct recycling direct recycling means uh, you do some kind of certain pretreatment then you recover the cathode material and do some relithiation of the cathode uh, material so that it can be reused as a new cathode material for new battery so that would be very efficient and effective. But till now, the very less commercial uh, application of direct cycling I've seen globally. So these are some certain parameters uh, that uh, I've taken into consideration. Like uh, if you see the technology point, uh, mechanical, uh, Recycling is uh, now effective in Europe, US, China, Korea, and India also. But in the post treatment, uh, like pyrometallurgy, it is highly effective in Europe and US because uh, in Europe and US, if you go for hydro process, uh, the OPEX will be very high compared to pyro. And in uh, hydro process, it is very much. Uh, benefit for China, Korea, and India due to its low OPEX. Presently, uh, existing Indian players have set up like uh, mechanical process 10,000 tons per annum, but there is no pyrometallurgy set up in India. And hydro can be assumed around 2,000 tons per annum. 
in future uh, uh, mechanical plus hydro we are expecting 30000 tons per annum and uh, hydro also similarly 30000 tons per annum in india then in economic point of view uh, for mechanical uh, recycling process uh, i think uh, there is no certain uh, capacity uh, required it depends on the investor but for pyrometer energy definitely you have to set a very higher volume higher size of capacity like more than 10000 tons per year and for hydro process something around 2000 tons per annum could be viable for you but here you have to consider valuable metal recovery in terms of capex requirement uh, mechanical process is very low pyro is very high then in case of hydro we have seen we have found that uh, some like 10 million us dollar could be enough to set up here in india for a sizable 2000 tons of uh, scrap input in case of opex obviously uh, mechanical process will so will be low then in case of pyrometallurgy it will be high due to energy cost and in case of hydro it will be medium because uh, low energy cost and uh, obviously it involves a lot of uh, chemicals consumption during the process. So this is a case study just we did uh, with a battery pack without uh, going deep into any battery chemistry. We just procured from one OEM and how we landed into loss that I want to show you. So we procured the battery pack about around 30,000 rupees. So when you disassemble the battery, we found all these components, cover, then components uh, and cells. So when we uh, evaluated the cost of the required materials, so that was around 31,558 rupees. Then our process cost, uh, like transportation, then disassemble and uh, sell to black mass, it uh, gave us around 3,389 uh, rupees. So when we summed up, like uh, total our goods sold, and then our procurement cost and battery cost. So finally, we found that it is a loss. So it is uh, like for the all recyclers, we have to consider in this way, like whenever you are procuring the batteries, the most important, uh, like uh, your battery pack, logistic value, and the chemistry value. Both are very important. So, chemistry value means uh, suppose an MC811 value and an MC11 value is completely different cost. That is a we need a lot of study, lot of R&D work regarding the value proposition of batteries, and then we can approach the OEMs accordingly. And OEMs also need to give the proper data to the recycler. So those things uh, could be done in future when EVs. Scenario will be in grown up stage in India. So, these are the main challenges uh, that uh, I have pointed out. So, in the transportation cost, whenever, uh, whenever we are procuring the LIVs, uh, lithium and battery scrap from the portable devices like laptop or mobile phones, that cost is different compared to your EV pack. Let's say whenever you are getting 10 ton of uh, scrap, like mobile phone batteries, the transportation cost will be definitely different compared to EV pack. Because in 10 ton uh, truck, we cannot carry 10 ton of EV pack. It could be maybe two to three ton, but the logistic cost will be same. So there we are landing into very high cost of logistic value in, in terms of uh, battery transportation. Second thing is your pack design. So all the OEMs have different kind of design. If you see all these uh, scooter, so many variety of design, design and uh, the recyclers have to do so much of R&D to disassemble the cover and components. So here the main cost is manpower, time, those things are under every time you have to innovate your design. So this is 
like uh, something if you could simplify with the OEMs, they can uh, design for certain disassemble uh, way, then it will reduce your cost. And obviously recycling technology and uh, profitable scale, like uh, we have to do proper assessment uh, to take, to consider proper recycling technology uh, with scale. So pyrometallurgy process always needs higher input load compared to hydrometallurgy. Then considering the chemistry of batteries is also topmost choice to achieve the profitability of recycling. Uh, whenever you go for choosing chemistry, LFP recycling will never give you high profit compared to NMC and NCO. So you have to do the facility design for each one, LFP as well as NMC and NCO. Because in India, if you see coming uh, decade, you will find LFP will be definitely more than 70% market demand in India. So all the recyclers have to think very careful whenever they are planning to set up recycling facility, either hydro way or direct or pyro. So that is very key point for future of India. Then the uh, recovered metal market. The metal market always very big role to achieve your BEP. So whenever you are producing any metal grade or battery grade material, that will give you very good revenue and you can achieve your BEP very quickly. So that is very key role. Then also inflation. The market inflation always fluctuate year by year. So whenever we are planning for any kind of project, if you are not meeting or you are not completing the project in timeline, then definitely you will be in loss because the inflation will continuously upper side of the investment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mishra. Thank you for that presentation. And I think uh, all the numbers you presented on the economics of LIB recycling were very, very insightful. And uh, I really appreciate uh, you talking about different kinds of batteries and how the profitability paths will, uh, will differ for different kinds of batteries. I think that is a very important point that all the people in the recycling industry need to uh, be aware of. We have Mr. Randhir Singh from CEO of, uh, CEO of 4C Advisors moderating the stakeholder roundtable. And the panelists are Mr. ALN Rao, who's the CEO of Exigo Recycling, Mr. Gaurav Dolwani, CEO of Lico, and Mr. Venkat Rajaraman, CEO of Signy Energy. So during this uh, stakeholder roundtable, we will talk about uh, many aspects of lithium-ion battery recycling in India including touching a topic such as the current trend of black mass export, EPR guidelines, their implementation, and policy recommendations. So I would like to invite all of the panel members to please uh, switch on their cameras. And uh, then I, yeah. OK, hi. Welcome, Mr. Venkat. Welcome, Mr. Rao. And good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. And I'll hand it over to Randhir to take this uh, stakeholder uh, panel forward. Thank you. Thank you, Priyakshi. And uh, welcome, Mr. Rao, uh, Gaurav, and uh, Venkat. I think uh, I'm meeting uh, again and again with you guys at different forums. Uh, however, uh, nevertheless, recycling, in fact, is a very, very burning topic right now. Uh, it's very significant, not only in terms of why this country actually has to do something which is sustainable, but also actually this is very much required for us to leapfrog in battery manufacturing also. We have released the already battery waste management rules and we say that some of the recycled material has to be used again, but what we need to do for the recycling, the capex intensive industry. I think those are the points which are not yet been touched. So in terms of the recycling industry, currently it is passing through a phase wherein lot, not only the policy push is required, but the financial incentives are also required at different levels, at central at, as well as at the state level. Industry is actually 
what I have seen is very much ready to put in money from their end. But just before this, we have seen in a presentation that still it doesn't make too much of economical sense to recycle the batteries as of now. Further, in terms of the technology, this is an evolving technology. We have seen the NMC 622546, then 811 coming up, and now the next, we are also looking at the NMX, which will come on. So what happens to the recycling industry? They, every time they have to actually fine tune for their similar output, if these technologies as an input keeps on changing. And this not only requires the know-how, but sometimes even the machineries needs to be changed. And all these things are the capex intensive again. Plus, what adds to the final, you know, the economics to this recyclers is the EPR certificates. And uh, I'm not sure for uh, how many people of how many people are already aware, but for the plastic in August this year only, CPC has started giving its online. And I think the next leg, which is going to be followed, is for the for the BWMR 2022, which is battery waste management rules. There are still many challenges which are directly related to the EPR certificates to be issued for these recyclers. And I think after this plastic recycling portal is ready, the next leg I can expect should be coming soon. We'll be hearing more about it from Mr. Rao and others. Somebody was talking just before this uh, about the LFP. So, of course, uh, currently LFP is in so much demand in terms of the vehicles. But LFP adoption is actually very much directly related to the price of the material. The price of the material is falling. So it's not the LFP which is going to continue uh, in this much demand. You know, uh, it, there is a balance between the density which is required and the batteries and how much you can actually afford. So when people are moving to the much more higher density of NMC in, top, in form of the NMX, which is 910, definitely there will be a more weightage to our NMC. And plus the prices are also going very down. So uh, in future, again, the adoption of NMC, even in the Asia Pacific is going to increase. This is uh, just the starting uh, thing which I wanted to point it out. And now let's move on to the discussions maybe mr rao this is first thing let's start with you you are a veteran in this industry and uh, i think it would be very important for us to understand what are your insights into the current trends and the challenges in the lib recycling market plus to be very specific how is exigo recycling is adapting to these trends and challenges thank you randir uh, for the introduction and uh... It's a very, very interesting question and um, at the right juncture where the country is currently. Um, you know, the confusion that existed for the last three, four years from 2001 onwards when the battery rules got introduced for lead acid battery, nothing happened. But the 2022 rules in the Niti Aayog where we were all members, where we were given the task of coming out with the BWMR rules, I think we had gone through multiple iterations and finally we were able to put up a beautiful rule, which is the talk of the town globally, I would say. And uh, every stakeholder is covered in this. Um, still quite a few confusions, but the portal that has come out from CPCB is an interesting portal for all 10 commodities uh, that's been covered. And uh, the refurbishing is another big part of the second use that should be coming in very soon. But um, the portal is live now. As, as a policy and as an instrument through the portal, I think we have covered ground to a large extent. Now comes the implementation part of the entire aspect there. Um, producers still are confused uh, to a large extent. And uh, the economics that needs to be done in the country is evolving. There are various ways of uh, having contractual um, agreements signed. But however, as a country, as any one recycler per se, there is not even one who is able to demonstrate a complete ecosystem right from upstream technology, outputs, downstream economies of scale and profitability. 
Now, we have heard in other presentations earlier of the profits and losses that are there in this industry. This is CapEx heavy. Yes, indeed, it's CapEx heavy, but India is a very, very large country. And uh, India has got its own problems. Uh, geography wise, we have hot and cold, we have rains, we have dry climates, uh, moisture content. So each one acts as a uh, benefit, as an advantage and a disadvantage also. Water is also a friend and an enemy, I would say, in the battery industry. So the question here is that how do we evolve in each geography within India is going to be the big aspect there. And as Exigo, what we have done is that um, from a lab scale to a, to a bench scale to a pilot scale, and now we have put up a very large facility in a nine <laughs> acre site and where an industrial commercial scale plant for mechanical plus pyro and hydrometallurgical is what we have come out with. We are able to, uh, one of the challenge which we saw is technically the quality of your hydrometallurgy depends on the success of your uh, mechanical processing. And the enemies in mechanical processing, one of the enemy also is that or an impurity which is a purity as far well as battery is concerned is the electrolyte solution that comes in. And how good are you able to you know, recover that at the initial stage? That's something which we have worked technically and we're successful in that. Hence, the quality of the black mass that we are able to extract is of a very, very high grade, as well as the cost of hydrometallurgy is much, much lesser than the other uh, processors that we have seen globally. B, we've also seen that going forward, the automotive giants are going to get into this recycling bit in a very big way because it's going to be very expensive, as the previous speakers said, about the logistics or the thermal runaway incidents and the insurance costs that will be there of shipping across the world. What we have come out with is a modular model, which uh, in 3,000 square feet, we are able to put up a mechanical recycling plant that fits into four 20 feet shipping containers or two 40 feet shipping containers. And uh, in this way, we are able to address the issue of space with the global environmental concerns and compliances also. And that's, a, that's, a, that's a lead which we have taken. And so it becomes a plant in plant concept for any uh, giga factories or auto major per se. That's the second solution that we're given. And third, last but not the least is it's not just a question of the four main commodities of lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt there, which we're able to offer solution, but also what happens to the graphite, what happens to the plastics, the PCBs or the BMS that comes in, PCB recycling, plastic recycling, um, you know, all these copper and aluminum smelting, you've all set it up in a fully integrated recycling facility, hence, they're able to give a solution for anything and everything that comes into a battery pack. And that's what we have specialized in our offering it to the country. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Just a follow-up question. So currently, uh, uh, the what is the quality of black mass you are seeing uh, coming out from your factory and available in the market? Secondly, in terms of the metallurgy, uh, do you think churning out the battery grade from the NMC is easier. I'm not sure if you are doing the LFP. If you are doing the LFP, then definitely would like to hear uh, taking out the lithium from the LFP is much better. And the third part is what do you do of the electrolyte uh, that comes out during uh, the shredding part? Uh, Good questions. Um, quality of black mass Currently, since in the last one, two years time, we have seen traders buying black mass and exporting. It doesn't matter on the quality of black mass you're going to get because any which way it's going to get reprocessed once again. That's been the trend. But the payables that's there from the global refiners, especially Southeast Asia and China, is hovering around 60, 70% of only cobalt and nickel currently. And, but going forward, I think the payables will increase to other metals also. So the quality of black mass will determine the payable for you as a recycler from the global refiners if you are to export that. And secondly, 
if you are a hydrometallurgy player you will make more money if you are able to get a higher quality black mass and that higher quality black mass depends upon your mechanical processes whether you are using water or you are using nitrogen or you are using an inert uh, environment to process it matters how less cost you are able to put up the plant is what determines the success of you as an organization second um the lfp part the lfp part is a very interesting part we love lfp batteries um honestly what we have seen is that there is nothing called the one size fits all as far as uh, machineries and processes are concerned um fumes gas cleaning apmcs you know um the maintenance costs there the cost of shredders the cost of blades the cost of metal or if you are using glr let us say you know what sort of a lining do you use in a glr water all this matters hence um as we speak we are putting up multiple lines for dedicated chemistries and uh, each line uses a combination of a pyro hydro or a mechanical pyro or a mechanical pyro now that's the side of sort of lines which is a 100 200 meter line each line and which we are trying to set it up and the first line is operational the next two lines are will be operational for lfp dedicated in next two months time large capacities about we are pretty successful and also the type of shredders that we are able to put in uh, globally we have seen that in the west it's mostly people prefer to put in a complete battery pack into a shredder and shred we did not find it economical or viable hence we are going into dismantling discharging dismantling and the cells uh, uh, processing in the machineries hence multiple shredders 8 10 12 shredders multiple lines around 8 to 9 lines we will be setting up for multiple chemistries for mechanical hydro pyro various combinations and the last question is uh, can you repeat that last question which you said only electrolyte Uh, what do you do of electrolyte well, um well certain batteries have got a higher electrolyte content certain are very less in number there are many cells that comes in which electrolytes gets dried up also to a large extent now yeah. as of now you ask me we are only storing the electrolyte we don't have an answer literally Understood. you know yeah right. so but we have stored we know it's 100% pure whom to give and what to give we are still wondering that. agreed agreed right very right very right uh, garo moving on to you uh, so uh, you already have one facility in taloja uh, battery shredding facility and now you are trying to expand to another place which has been identified as bangalore uh, so couple of questions one is why bangalore uh, from you know mumbai to bangalore why not expand within the mumbai also or why not come towards the north this is one second thing is uh, how you determine the capacity you know because your cap uh, what i understand is your capacity the next of the next plant is going to be almost three times of your current plant so uh, we would like to understand on these two fronts is it that the market for the black mass is quite booming or uh, the requirement from the overseas is very high would you like to point it out yeah please gorav over to you thank you so the first question is yes we are based in mumbai we uh, built this plant in mumbai last year and commissioned it in october 22 we've been operational for about 14 months now in mumbai and we have achieved capacity utilization of almost 85 to 90% and hence the the next you know plausible step is expansion uh mumbai you know we uh, the facility we have is in a industrial area and quite uh, quite packed as it is we wanted it was always our plan to you know have multiple spokes or shredding mechanical units across india covering different geographies uh, different locations within the country uh, our strong belief is that transporting high voltage batteries such as cars and buses across india is difficult is expensive and is risky so our idea was always to expand to multiple locations um bengaluru was a, a logical next step for us uh, based on 
um, you know, the location we found, the kind of partners we are discussing with, uh, cell manufacturers that are setting up facilities in and around uh, Bengaluru, which will generate production waste. So that was the next logical step for us. Uh, talent available in Bengaluru as well, uh, in terms of refurbishment um, and hydrometallurgy, which is our next uh, logical step. So in Bengal, so in Mumbai, our capacity is 3,000 metric tons per annum. In Bengaluru, we'll be able to put two lines at 9,000 metric tons per annum each. Currently, we're putting setting up only one line, which will be operational by April 2024. We are setting up one line to evaluate what the technology or chemistry, rather, should be for the second line. We are seeing a rise in LFP usage in India. And as we cannot recycle NMC and LFP in the same lines to avoid cross-contamination, cross we're looking at two different lines. Today, we don't think that there is enough raw material only for LFP to run at that capacity that we are talking about. So we are going to wait for another 12 months before deciding what would be on the second line. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so just a, just a follow-up question. Uh, you're putting up the another facility shredding plant there. And uh, in fact, this, this, this leg is from the, my first question how much of black mass you export and why you export the black mass this is one and from which countries uh, you know the demand is coming whether demand is sufficient enough outside and demand is not uh, sufficient enough in india so Over to you. so let's say you produce uh, i don't know 3000 uh, tons of black mass how much you export yeah, uh, our input is 3,000, so our, roughly our black mass would be about 1,600 a year. Uh, we export, well, either directly or via uh, trading partners or other uh, options, we, were, we, we export roughly 85-90% of that material. Well, the biggest reason is that there is no capacities or capabilities of processing hydrometallurgy or pyrometallurgy or any kind of different technology at commercial scale in India. Yes, I mean, there are recyclers who are working on, uh, you know, setting up downstream, just like we are discussing about technology for downstream with international recyclers. And there are domestic players as well who are setting up, but none of them are at commercial scale at the moment. And I mean, if they were at commercial scale, we are happy to sell our black mass domestically. Uh, it Obviously, we are not, um, you know, it doesn't give us any... Uh, kind of satisfaction in selling it abroad. Uh, we are happier to sell it within India, but it, if, if, there's, if that market does not exist, it's a bit difficult for us to uh, find that. And ultimately, even uh, you know, after we go downstream and, and, pro and use hydrometallurgy or any other technology that even Mr. Mishra discussed earlier, the point is that we still don't have the entire ecosystem. So we don't have uh, cathode producers, we don't have anode producers. So even after recovering the salts today, I'm, I will be forced to export them. Understood. So it's not the economics, it's actually the demand for the material which is coming from outside. Perfect. Uh, Venkat, moving on to you, uh, you know, Signi is actually involved in a, in, in a various energy storage solutions. So my question is from that perspective, and from batteries for electric two wheelers to rooftop solar hybrid solutions. How do these, all the applications actually contributes to overall sustainability goals? And what role do you think the recycled batteries will play in your energy storage solutions? Yeah, thank you, Randir. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for having me. So I think it has been an interesting discussion. Uh, one of the points that I observed was one of the speakers said that we are going to have maybe more than 70% of LFP. Other speaker is saying that, hey, no, there is going to be newer chemistries which are coming in. And we are seeing that, uh, you know, in action today, right? You know, all the experts, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of very opinions. You know, we, um, no one has a crystal ball in terms of how the chemistries are going to evolve. But there are two or three major trends that we are seeing. One, of course, as you pointed out, Randi, one, 
I think clearly the move is moving towards a more higher uh, energy density. So the cathodes are moving more nickel rich, you know, less of cobalt and so on and so forth. Anode is moving from a graphite to a more silicon to a more maybe more, uh, you know, metal anode. And of course, electrolytes are moving from, uh, you know, liquid to a semi-solid to a solid. So I do see that uh, we are going to have a lot of discussions over the next 10 years, so which is going to be, so that's for sure, uh, you know, whatever that we are going to crystal ball gaze, you know, may or may not be true uh, as we move forward. Uh, but clearly in India, if I were to look at it, I think there was a lot of, uh, especially for the two wheelers, uh, you know, there was a lot of focus on the NMC chemistry earlier. And then we had an issue with all the safety constraints. There was a resurgence of LFP, but now the market is sort of, uh, you know, all over the place. And you talked about an NMX chemistry as well. So there are newer variants which are coming up. You know, there is a newer variant of LFP, which is an LMFP, which some of the manufacturers are doing. Uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, other forms of uh, uh, lithium sulfur and so on. So this is going to happen. So how Signy is seeing it is two. One, of course, this is a catch-22 situation for all the recyclers, right? So today, somebody was showing me how LFP is going to give a, you know, very low, uh, you know, value per kg. And you would need more of cobalt, more of, uh, you know, um, lithium. Uh, whereas the industry for sustainability wants to do less of cobalt and more of. So there is going to be a catch-22 situation for all of us. Uh, recyclers are in the thick of uh, things there. Uh, from our perspective, I think what's happening is India's market was very nascent until about two years back. Now people have started thinking about uh, sustainability, right? I think clearly in the design phase itself, People are looking at, hey, how do I make sure that these packs are, uh, you know, uh, can be reused? You know, I think, uh, you know, one of the speaker also talked about how the packs are very difficult to uh, sort of, you know, if you want to reuse or if you want to recycle, these are all today's, uh, there is a, there is a focus which is now getting in, how do you make the design which is amenable for reuse? How do you make the design which is amenable for uh, recyclability? And the second thing which is also doing is there is a lot of specific designs that are to be done so that the end of life cell validation and recoverability of the of the cells and also getting comfort in terms of what is the second life behavior after the mobility, for example, right? So uh, the the you know I think still a lot of recycling happens from the electronic gadgets, mobility batteries you know, haven't reached that level of maturity, but the thinking is there with the, you know, designers in terms of how do you make it more sustainable, but this is going to be interesting play as we go because the underlying cell chemistries are changing and, uh, you know, we need to set up each one of them, depending on the chemistry, there is a separate recycling line. So this is going to be a very interesting uh, stage to watch out for is what I'm thinking, Randir, actually. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Venkat. Uh, in fact, this also clarifies about the future roadmap for the batteries. Now, one question which which is actually much talked about right now is about the EPR responsibility. Where in the value chain actually Signy stands in terms of the EPR? And what do you think is the uh, current stand in India in terms of the EPR and how it should look uh, actually? Yeah, so uh, EPR, I think uh, Rao talked about in terms of all the value chain for the EPR. Today, we are all sort of covered under uh, the extended producer responsibility. I think there is a fantastic work done by, uh, you know, a lot of members here to get into the CPCB portal, making sure that we have an online monitoring. All of us have gotten registered, so many of us. So whether it is OEM or a battery manufacturer or whether you are a recycler or whether you are an e-waste collector, uh, it is now mandated for all of us to get ourselves registered. And as per the new amendment, which is, uh, you know, which is also adding a lot of clarifications to what existed earlier, uh, so clearly, I think these are all steps in the right direction, right? Sydney is part of it. What I see as a challenge is a robust implementation plan, right? So today, the most important thing that we need to do is it doesn't suffer the fate of a lead acid battery recycling, right? So lead acid battery, uh, you know, recycling happened, you know, still happens in a lot of informal sector in spite of having a clear policy. Uh, the reason for that is, I think, you know, the, the most critical aspect is an implementation and monitoring mechanism. Uh, if it is not very effective, then that would uh, uh, 
uh, sort of define the interest of an informal sector. Uh, but the work which is done, especially for the online monitoring, as well as the EPR certificates and making sure that everybody is accountable in the ecosystem, uh, you know, are the steps in the right direction? Again, we are still very early because the portal is still, you know, very nascent. But I'm hoping that in the next 12 months, we should have a lot more clarity on that, Randhi. Done, done, done. Sure, sure, sure. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Rao, uh, again, I'm moving on to you and a very pertinent question which comes when the adoption of EV increases is about the second use of the batteries, the refurbishment and the reconditioning part. Uh, what do you see and where Exigo is actually, uh, whether they are, you are working on the refurbishing and the re uh, reconditioning of the batteries right now or do you have any plans? If yes, what is what are your learnings? This is one. Second part is, uh, you know, the EPR of the recycling and the EPR for the refurbishing. How do you, uh, you know, differentiate between these two? And how what what are your suggestions to let's say CPCB or let's say to the government in terms of how the EPR certificate or the credit has to be distributed among these two works? And there's a second life globally. You know, I'm yet to see somebody who has invested millions of dollars, set up lines employing hundreds of people, started churning out new products using used cells. You know, um, I've not seen maybe um, yet to learn, but I've not seen such cases there. I'm ready to invest a few millions of dollars in setting up lines, setting up plants for Second Life. But... Um, there are demonstrations, there are some examples, and there are some certain stories out there, uh, especially in the grid applications where we have seen that some success is there. Now, the question here is that how viable it is for anybody to get into a second life um, you know, solution per se. Exigo has tried, tested it, because in the ecosystem, since we have another company also, we have diagnostics and all that, laptops and mobile phones, what we have understood is identification of an asset, the ownership of the asset from the producer when it switches over to a consumer, right? Is it going to belong to the end consumer? Is it going to belong to the leasing company? Because leasing is big, as the fleet owners. Who was going to sell the battery is the first question. Second, diagnostics remotely of the battery of the SOH and coming out with a pricing model is going to be the biggest factor you know, across the country, which we are developing that. We have developed in the other product categories. This is another product which we're adding. We're offering this as a solution, as a SaaS model to uh, all the stakeholders per se. Once I'm able to understand the um, pricing, the AI-based pricing um, of the unit which we want to buy, what happens then is the logistics and all that packaging, shipping, warehousing, storage solutions. And finally, is the discharging or the, the second life solutions itself. What we are trying to cover is the first part where we are able to, given all the basic necessities for identification of asset, evaluation, pricing, validation, and bringing into the plant. Second, because the rule states, BWMR rule states that you become an owner of a new product using used cells, we are not really keen in taking up that ownership at this moment of the EPR ownership of the new product per se. Hence, we will be having contracts with third parties who are into this particular business. So yes, we have tried it, tested it. We are going to give the entire ecosystem, except the final product would be done by another uh, uh, other third party for us for that matter. Investing a few millions of dollars into that business. Second, as far as the BWMR rules are concerned, as far as the credits are there for recycling and refurbishing. Refurbishing, we've not started yet. Being a steering committee member of the battery waste uh, seen CPCB also, we have works are on. We are working on guidelines now for shipping, transportation, and uh, packaging and all that. Post that, we will come into refurbishing or second life. We will be coming into it. Discussions are happening with multiple stakeholders, but it's early times still. It's very complicated because here the ownership of the module of the pack and the cell varies and uh, you'll have to uh, connect all these stakeholders through single portals and 
fit into a proper ecosystem there. And um, credits, giving in the credits out there is still a very nascent stage as well as the uh, recycling is concerned. What we have done is that um, three types of, in, in CPCB has done this and three types of recyclers that have been identified and uh, you know the mechanical guys are the ones who are only up to black mass, but the rule says end product and black mass is not an end product. Hence they are not being considered for giving in the credits there to any producers, but the other recyclers and refiners are eligible to give in. Uh, as a representative of the battery recyclers, we are trying to talk to the government working some sort of a mechanism for the mechanical recyclers where they also can avail of certain credits. Talks are going on currently with various stakeholders there. But refurbishing credits not started yet. It's very, very premature as we speak. Okay, understood. Uh, Gaurav, uh, I would like to have your views also around this, uh, the credits which are being given at different stages. Uh, for the uh, shredding plants, for the metallurgy plants, which uh, almost uh, very few, two or three are doing right now in India. And in terms of the refurbishment, which is actually the need of the R and going forward, uh, what I see and what I have seen in the industry in India, in fact, in China, as well as in the US, some of the people have set up specific, uh, only uh, specifically for the refurbishment. And the Mercedes is one of the plant which they have set up recently only for the refurbishment for their batteries because they don't want it to be going to the recycling directly. So uh, how do you see uh, uh, the collaborations in this aspect is required? The collaboration in particular is because there you actually learn how to you know, unlock the current battery or some sort of uh, learning from the manufacturer directly should come to you so that it's possible for you to do some refurbishing without actually damaging the uh, cells plus uh, in terms of the regulatory part, where it is right now lacking, and what do you think has to be done from that perspective? Yeah, uh, thank you for your questions. Um, first one I'll talk about is refurbishment. I think refurbishment is extremely complicated. Uh, it it really requires you to have a consistent source of the same kind of batteries or same kind of cells for you to develop packs consistently so that you know there is an actual value to be added currently what we see is very fragmented kind of you know uh, batteries or packs coming our way most importantly oems are not able to share information with us uh, with regards to life you know uh, number of cycles that have been used number of cycles that are left uh, many oems are you know fitting uh, bmss that they have imported and may not necessarily be, you know, aware of every single, uh, you know, thing inside it. Uh, so it becomes a bit tricky for us to assess what, how much life is left and uh, accordingly, you know, for us to give guarantees on a second life. So it is tricky. Uh, what we see in the West, like you're saying with Mercedes and yes, I think with bus and four wheeler manufacturers, uh, there is an application of, um, you know, a second life, especially energy storage. We've seen in the case of Tesla, like Powerwall, et cetera, you know, for energy storage for homes. Uh, I think it's a very good idea, but I, that that's coming from OEMs directly to recyclers or rather refurbishers and with complete information with, uh, you know, the refurbisher is in complete uh, know-how of what they're getting and hence they can also provide guarantees and warranties ahead. Now, if we talk about the EPR part that you had asked me, uh, yeah, I mean, we have had so many discussions on this at various meetings. Uh, you know, the point is that I think that assessment is extremely critical. What is the current capacity and capability in our country to process black mass? That number is so small. Uh, when you look at the export numbers of black mass, most of the recyclers who claim that they are doing hydrometallurgy or any other kind of, uh, you know, downstream processing are still exporting black mass. So the question really remains is that 
if we don't have the capacity and capability yet, then why are we putting restrictions on black mass producers to get EPR credits? Now, I understand the, the stance that we should keep um, you know, the minerals within the country. I completely agree with it. But ultimately, in, in the lack of any cathode or anode producer, the salts are getting exported again. So ultimately, we still lose those minerals to countries abroad. So we, I, my suggestion is always that let's build a framework where we can restrict, whether you want to restrict black mass export, you want to restrict salts, whatever it could be, but it should be within a certain time frame where you allow the ecosystem to develop organically because such forced reactions or knee-jerk reactions where you know in the middle of the year to say that this is going to be restricted i mean i what looking at lead acid batteries it just makes me think that you know there will be players that will set up small plants and do all kinds of things they're unscientific they're unscrupulous because there is nobody who's monitoring the yield or the purity of these sorts in any case so i could be saying i'm taking out lithium carbonate but who knows what it's what purity it is and how safe the uh, you know the working conditions are is it environmentally friendly is it sustainable there's no tracking auditing checking for these things agreed agreed gaurav and uh, you know metallurgy is a tricky part and metallurgy uh, uh, up to the extent where in the metals and the salts coming out are pcam ready that in itself is very very tricky and we have seen this, uh, mo most of the factories, even in China, they are struggling to come out with the PCAM ready salts. And in fact, uh, in the recent, in fact, the last two years only, they, they, they are in a position to recycle up to the extent wherein it is battery grade or so to say the PCAM ready uh, uh, salts grade, which is coming out. So it, it's a long way to go from that perspective, for sure. Uh, now, Venkat, actually, uh, your role is very unique here when we talk about the you know uh, the battery storage solution provider so in terms of uh right right now the biggest adopter that is the three-wheeler and whose batteries are now going to come into the market for the recycling in fact most of the batteries right now in terms of the ev which are coming out in the market are from the two-wheelers and the three-wheelers within the three-wheelers e-rickshaws who uses the lithium-ion batteries so in terms of the signi energy do you provide specific solutions to them if yes then what type of life generally these people expect in uh in e-rickshaw segment and plus the what type of uh chemistry these people are okay with because you know it's a it's a low cost segment and i'm sure they are not expecting to be the high grade nmc they should have which has high energy density space wise they are pretty much okay yeah, so uh, e-rickshaw is a very uh, unique segment for India, right? Uh, you know, um, uh, give credit, uh, you know, they have been at the forefront of driving electrification. Um, and the estimate is, I think there are over 2 million e-rickshaws. Of course, these numbers are not very, uh, uh, this thing, because these are all unregulated uh, market. Uh, but the estimation is also, there is a lot of transition from a lead acid battery to a lithium ion battery. Um, as you rightly pointed out, I think it's an unregulated one, which also means that there is a lot of imported batteries uh, flooding this, uh, you know, because there is no, uh, you know, proper regulatory framework for them. Uh, of course, Signi does not, uh, uh, you know, we don't sell it to the e-rickshaw market, uh, mainly because of this reason, because it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and these packs have been... Uh, of inferior quality, if I may be allowed to say so. Um, uh, I think, you know, there are there, there needs to be, and that creates a problem along the lines that Gaurav talked about, right? Today, there are two major things which are very much required for, uh, you know, for uh, this sustainability and recycling part of it. One, you need to have this, uh, you know, the battery uh, information, the traceability information. I think somebody talked about the battery passport. 
that needs to be part of every one of them so that we know looking at it uh, where was it produced what is the chemistry all the details which are there uh, and the second part of it is of course there is a you know the the rest of the market has gotten regulated under the aas 156 framework you know so where you know a lot of details are already available but this market is still uh, you know uh, not there so how we are looking at it is one i think uh, there there is a need for a uh, innovative uh, I think design, right? The e-rickshaw today, though it is unregulated, um, once, uh, you know, if somebody can increase the battery life significantly, right, through all the things that what we talked about, newer chemistries, newer design, better safety, and so on and so forth, uh, the levelized cost on a per kilometer basis is going to be better, right? And that's sustainability is going to be directly driven out of that. And it also has a direct uh, correlation to the miles that we are able to squeeze out of this battery. Uh, and the driver's aspirations are also exactly that, right? Today, when they are moving from a lead acid to a lithium ion, he does not want to change it in, uh, you know, 18 months, 24 months, but that's where the quality is. And second thing is, there is also a, we see a market which is moving towards a swapping uh, operator, right? Especially places like Delhi, uh, where the same design uh, philosophy of better design where the swapping use case is inherently they are, uh, you know, they, they want to echo the better juice from the asset, right? Because that's how the only way that they can make their uh, money. And the design needs to have a far higher abuse tolerance. Uh, so in short, I think we need to have one traceability part of it. And number two, we need to make sure that there are some regulatory framework put in, but not only for the packs that are getting sold, but also how do you recycle it? Uh, from that market, uh, that's going to be critical for uh, for that market, Randeer. Uh, what is your target market as a Signi? Uh, we are currently on EV two wheelers, so we are uh, supplying to the three out of the top ten OEMs which are there, and we are also uh, supplying for the L five loader vehicles. We're basically into B two B actually. Yeah, understood. So in fact, the battery passport thing in in battery swapping a draft policy which I released uh, uh, a year back. Uh, I have actually uh, introduced something called battery identification number, wherein we, in fact, the standard is also ready. Uh, it might be published soon. Now I'm out of uh, Niti, but uh, BIS is actually ready with those standards. It's a bet at battery level, the identification number is exactly similar to the win, the wheeler vehicle identification number, which we have. It's very unique and very, very good work has been done by, uh, you know, the industry was involved. Uh, it, it was a big panel in ETD 5.1, which was involved by the BIS and all. And I think this is something which is very, which we ourselves, that means India has done. And each and every battery can be tracked and traced. Both the things can happen through this. So uh, let's hope uh, such thing actually comes out. I think uh, uh, before we end, let us have final words with, from Mr. Rao. Uh, what do you think uh, one thing which... Uh, industry needs to do and one thing which government needs to do uh, in the next two to five years for this recycling to actually pick up, up to the salts. Um, India needs to look into offering multiple solutions and create the entire ecosystem in the country. The efforts that's been put in, the incentives in EVs of fame one, fame two, PLI schemes that have come in is all from the manufacturing perspective, but from the recyclers perspective, there's none that has come in except the Specs 1.0 that has come in, which is very, very meager, uh, giving in around 25% and you know uh, two crosses threshold there, threshold number. The Specs 2.0 we are discussing there and we're trying to increase it. Support to the recyclers, if you see in the US and the West and Europe, the support that's been given to the recycling industry is phenomenal. I mean, uh, people sitting in a lab who's called a recycler has got billion dollar valuations already there and investments coming in where people like us, we are investing personal monies and have hardly got any support from the government. So that's a very, very big negative uh, and which needs to be addressed by the government very soon. Large stakeholders in the country are interested to invest. But however, the law, the BWMR rules have given a direction, but still implementation, creating the ecosystem to end to end needs to be supported well. If done rightly, trust me, India can become the recycling hub for the world. We have seen global refiners using India as a spoke. India can also do that. 
And India has got the best of talent as far as refurbishing and recycling is concerned in a very, very cost-effective manner. And we are experts in doing multiple things. If the right support can be given by the government, India can become a hub and self-sufficiency as far as commodities are concerned, urban mining is concerned, can become very, very big reality in the country. So the objective is what has been done is only around 20, 30%. We have a long way to go. And I think a fresh round of discussions is required between the government and the stakeholders to actually help fast track the ecosystem in the country. It's not a 10 year plan. It should be the next two to three years plan. That's the way which I look for. Great. So Gaurav, what are your thoughts about what industry should do actually uh, and what government should do the next two to five years? Uh, yeah, I agree with Mr. Rao, you know, that there is no incentive, state or center. I mentioned that in my presentation as well. Um, given that we are competing today against Europe and America uh, in the recycling ecosystem, because they have just taken off as well. But recyclers there are, you know, able to access, I would say, unlimited capital uh, at numbers that are you know, baffling to us because we, we don't even know what to where to start over here. Uh, Mr. Rao rightly said that we are still investing private money in, in expansion. So, yeah, I mean, there has to be uh, some kind of incentive. Uh, yes, you know, we are willing to comply on all kinds of uh, parameters that the government suggests, but for at least formal sector where people are recycling in, in a righteous way, we should be able to apply for some kind of benefits. The PLI scheme, which was for ACC, was well spoken about globally. It was very well accepted, right? It, uh, so similarly, if we could go down that battery value chain, look at critical minerals, look at recycling, refurbishing, I think the entire ecosystem needs to be uh, built, not only one part of it. So I believe that there, it is in the intention of the government to uh, incentivize the rest. So we we would welcome that. Now, in terms of uh, any other kind of support that I would ask the government would always be, let us import batteries, let us import black mass, remove restrictions for all kinds of import. Uh, today, you know, if we look at how what happened in China over the last 10 years, they secured supply chains all from all over the world. Today, they don't import black mass. They have restrictions, but they still get batteries from abroad, from as far as Brazil and Africa and Middle East. So my point is that let us, let us import batteries. At the end of the day, we are bringing critical minerals into the country. Today, we're fighting about don't send it out, but why would you stop it from bringing it in? So... The, you know, I think the excess raw material that can come into the country will develop that ecosystem further. More players will come. We will be able to see more profitability. If we are more profitable, more money will follow that. So it's just, a, you know, a very natural progression. Great. Uh, uh, Venkat, so finally from you, uh, are you already exporting some of the batteries which you manufacture? And what is your outlook towards entering into other segments? You are already doing two wheelers. You already say top three. You are already providing the batteries. So what is your outlook about that? And the next part is in terms of this entire, uh, you know, the urban mining part, because definitely your batteries, I'm not sure how many has started coming back to you uh, used batteries. What do you do of them? And what are your plans? Uh, how you are going to tackle those? Yeah, so today we are not exporting, uh, the, to answer your first question, but we do see that as a, a opportunity. India market is itself is uh, fairly big and growing so, uh, uh, so rapidly. So uh, at this point of time, we are looking at an alternative. Of course, we are into uh, you know, energy storage for you know, solar renewable energy, which, which is how Signi began its journey. So that we are doing it. Uh, so from a question in terms of um, how we are seeing this, uh, you know, market uh, to grow, I think, you know, the Indian market, we are seeing that, uh, you know, in spite of all the policy hiccups that are going on, we do believe that uh, uh, this is going to grow because this is the only option that is uh, left for us. 
um, and uh, and in terms of uh, you know uh, in terms of I think the you know um, uh, the innovation which is required I think we definitely see uh, the design for reuse right I think we talked about uh, that in the previous one making sure that the battery pack itself is more visible right in terms of the number of cycles in terms of you know making sure the state of health is visible all of them I think I know that just not the Signi but several uh, good battery pack manufacturers are integrating that as part of that so we are going to see that coming you know in uh, you know in in the newer uh, ones uh, from the battery we have about close to about 125000 batteries in the market but we have not started seeing that yet in a very small portion yet we would start seeing that from 2024 onwards um, that's where i think uh, you know we would have a lot more interaction with the recyclers and i do believe that there is a lot of uh, opportunity for innovation on the recycling uh, you know i think we spoke about the uh, no re cell of U.S. Department of Energy or EIT, you know, energy, all of them could be, you know, where we could have a non-industry, but, uh, you know, a collaborative approach, which is open for all the, uh, you know, all the participants, you know, which is basically pre-IP uh, innovation. Maybe that is something that would be very useful as well, Randir, actually. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. I think uh, uh, very, very good thoughts and a very good uh, discussion we had today. And... Uh, I must say, I mean, just to close, there are, uh, there are hiccups right now available, but enough, but a lot of efforts are right now being going on from the industry, from the government side. And these are coming up, of course, uh, slow, but I, I think there are still many things needs to be done uh, from the recycling perspective. And uh, not only the portal up and running full time for the EPRs, proper credits to be given to the people who are doing the you know the stage one stage two and the stage three i'm not taking the name of the you know the shredding and the uh, mineral and finally the uh, pgam ready uh, salts which are coming out but a proper uh, because finally it depends upon how ready we are and accordingly the incentivization and also the encouragement has to happen at different level those things still needs to be done so finally, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me in this discussion. Over to you, Priyakshi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randhir, for uh, moderating this wonderful panel. And thank you so much, Mr. Rao, Mr. Dolwani, and Mr. Rajaraman for your, for your thoughts. Apart from that, I would like to thank all the panelists for being proactive in answering so many of uh, participant questions. Um, uh, I think everybody has answered a lot of questions. Uh, Mr. Dolwani, Mr. Rao, I can see answers from Mr. Debaraj and Mr. Randhir as well. So thank you so much. That uh, really makes our job easier. So there are still some open questions. There are some some questions that I see are sort of uh, have been sort of covered during the discussions or have been already answered. But if there are any particular questions that uh, uh, any of the panelists, uh, apart from uh, uh, you know, everyone, uh, not just the panelists in the panel discussion, but any of the speakers also would like to answer live, please uh, feel free to do so. There were a couple of questions that were submitted over email when we announced the event. So I will just, I have some of them in front of me. And there is one question related to EPR credits that uh, I can put forth. And it says that the battery waste management rules define battery materials as materials in a battery. So can the black mass producers claim EPR credits for any other battery materials other than minerals? For example, uh, plastics, uh, iron, or uh, aluminum, et cetera. So it's a technical question if uh, any of the uh, speakers would like to address it. Uh, yeah, I think black mass producers can get credit for iron, copper, and aluminum at the moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, in the sense that what it's been done is that every stakeholder in three levels are able to get in something or the other, you know, and uh, hence, how do we accommodate all the types? Like, there's one more question which says that as a startup, if I were really into mechanical and what needs to be done, will I get that support or not? So, it answers that question that yes, there will be a part, but however, there's another element also where. The commercial aspects, as far well as the EPR um, is concerned, can be received by an L1 recycler or a mechanical recycler from a full-fledged recycler or a refiner. 
So that's some commercial aspect where the interconnect can happen also. Even though the sourcing would take place by the mechanical recycler, the actual credit would be given by the L2 or L3 recycler, but commercially, the, uh, the, the benefit can be given to the L1 recycler. In that way, the ecosystem gets connected statutory compliance wise also and commercially also and the entire industry benefits in that particular way understood but however the, the the mass balance that is there will come in into the portal in a very detailed way anything and everything that is being recovered or extracted or which is disposed of as hazardous will come in the epr portal which will have to be shown so the sum has to match the total that you are purchasing for that matter. And based on that, the evolution of the EPR portal will happen gradually. And in the steering committee, we will be looking into all these things. And in the new amendment that came in, including the pricing element that has been coming in, because one of the elements that came in was recyclers say that the producers would be paying less to them, hence they will be making less of profits or no profits. The producers complain, saying that maybe the recyclers will charge them on a higher level, and hence that might be a problem for them to cost increases substantially for them. Hence, all the verticals, e-waste battery, plastics, your tires, oils, ELV, everybody will have a min and max that will come in through the steering committee, it will be decided, so that it doesn't go beyond the boundaries there. And that's something which is coming up in a very serious way, so that um, the entire stakeholders are covered on a commercial aspect also. And we have seen examples of people trying to hoodwink the system by exploiting loopholes. And this would address that. And if somebody is trying to give it a dead cheap prices or somebody is paying, overpaying, we know there's a foul play out there. But everything is their database now and the portal will be able to catch a lot of such things and hence uh, bring in a much more better compliance and controls over the entire ecosystem. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Rao. I'm just going through the open questions and if there are any questions that uh, any of the panelists would like to take, otherwise I think we can wrap up the session. There are around uh, 70 questions that uh, have been answered already. Uh, Uh, you're on I can take up a question from Mr. Jitendra, Jitendra Samdani. Is there any specific data of recycling of each constituent in batteries such as cathode, anode, PCB, plastics? Well, um, in the last few years' time, we being in the consumer electronics batteries, this is one question right from the minister to various MOEF officials keep asking stakeholders of data. The demand of the batteries is known because of the consumption in products or imported as a product, but however, recycling data are not available. And that's something which this portal is trying to arrive at. Hence, the EPR targets for commodities plus the mass balance of other commodities and the disposal of hazardous elements is being captured or will be captured in the portal. Over a period of time, this data will be published in the portal itself for general public. And that will give a much more uh, clear cut picture for the entire country. What is available and what is not available? This is the, the uh, recycling capacities available and whether everything can be recycled or some has to be exported or not. So that is what the portal will start giving information. Okay. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, sounds like an interesting one from Mr. Uh, from Gopi Tarun. Can a third party provide traceability solutions through blockchain or is there a mandate that only government should be doing it? We're talking about battery traceability. So I don't know where uh, we stand at the moment or can third party propose any solutions for this? Yeah, I can take that, uh, uh, Priya, actually. So, uh, yeah, so I think this is discussed at length uh, at the battery passport I can talk about because uh, they have uh, allowed uh, third party uh, to come up with this uh, blockchain based uh, you know uh, apps which can be done and they have also sort of defined a framework within which one can do that 
um, for want of time. So if somebody wants to get more details, let them go to globalbattery.org, uh, which is where this is part of the Global Battery Alliance. Uh, they have defined a white paper in terms of how this can be done and one can take a look at it. And then uh, um, the, the question as Randir was saying, we may need to sort of have that mandatory for our uh, manufacturing, but a lot of details, a lot of uh, thoughts have gone into as part of the battery passport actually. Okay. Yeah. Understood. yeah so to continue what Venkat said, what India we're looking at is tracking and tracing from the time a battery or a pack or a module or a cell is introduced in the country till the disposal. Where the battery passport says is ethical sourcing onwards, it starts till the end. So that's the difference between both of these. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we can, um, okay, I can see Mr. Mishra is typing an answer. So while he does that, I would again like to thank all the panelists and speakers for making time to be here uh, in this event today. And also all the audience members for uh, patiently listening uh, to our panelists, our speakers and asking good questions, a lot of questions and making it a productive session for everyone. So the there was there were a lot of questions about whether the recording will be available. The recording will be made available. Uh, give us a couple of days. You can check uh, EV Reporter YouTube channel next week, and uh, you can see you will be able to see snippets from the event there. Uh, 